Good evening everyone. Welcome to Dust for Peace. On the eve of Candlemas, Imolk and Groundhog Day and the Festival of St. Bridget. So this is an auspicious moment in the turning of the seasons of the year. For us in the Northern Hemisphere, this is the lengthening of the days. And for our ancestors in the British Isles and in Europe, uh, this was the first signs of spring they would notice at this time. And in fact, the signs of spring are all around us at the moment uh, here in England. The snowdrops are out in my garden. Snowdrops also called Candlemas bells because their emergence uh, indicated that Candlemas was about to happen the end of January, beginning of February. Also, at the moment, I noticed that the birds are, are pairing up and I've seen some of the birds in courting rituals. And the general lengthening of the days, uh, all the signs are that uh, spring is on the way, despite the fact that the winter weather is still with us. These uh, various festivals from different traditions, the festival of Imolk, the Celtic pagan festival, the Christian festival of Candlemas, and the uh, American uh, modern folklore festival of Groundhog Day, they're all celebrating this theme of renewal. So in the last couple of days, I've been uh, contemplating this theme of renewal. And it made me think about, uh, about new, uh, really. What is it to be new? So renewal being new again. Well, what was it like to be new the first time? So what is it that we can regain in the process of renewal? When I thought about moments in, in my life when I have felt new, what immediately came to mind was the moments uh, when uh, I was starting a new school, for example, a new pupil, pupil at school, or starting a new job, new employee, starting a new business, new business manager. And what was it that those situations had in common and also I guess when I uh, was when I became married and I was a newlywed what I had all those experiences of being new in common this is what I've been contemplating and certainly there was a sense of excitement of enthusiasm for entering a new phase of life also, a sense of apprehension, a certain anxiety, because I'm moving out of the familiarity zone of the phase of life that I've just been in. So my experience of being new has been this mixed experience of excitement, looking forward to a new phase of life, but also a certain apprehension moving out of what is familiar, putting myself in the hands of fate, uh, we could say the hands of destiny. This week I've been, as, as I've come to this point on the eve of Imolk uh, and Candlemas, I've been thinking about uh, whether I'm up for this, whether I'm in the right process for renewal. And certainly it was a bit of a shock. Recently I was singing and dancing with some of my colleagues in the Dancers of Universal Peace Movement. We were singing and dancing 
Imogen Candlemas themed uh, songs and symbolic dances uh, about renewal and awakening. And that was very nice, but I was kind of uneasily aware at the time that it was very pleasant in the present moment, but something was missing. I didn't have this sense of surging forwards into the spring and the summer that lie ahead. I just, <laughs> I just seen some notices here about chickens in the discussion panel here. Uh, of course, it's a great time of year. I, I used to keep chickens myself, and uh, this was the time of year I looked forward to because I kept them under natural daylight, and they would start to lay again uh, in late January, early February. So that was uh, that was a regular sign uh, of the awakening season. And for my Celtic ancestors, of course, they lived very agricultural lives. And so for them, it was the beginning of planting and sowing for the coming season, but also with the livestock, the birth of new life was imminent. And the, the Gaelic word imolk uh, means in the belly or uh, in milk, which are the signs that sheep are about to begin lambing. So this was just the moment before lambing would begin. And the time when the it was obvious that the lambs were on the way because the ewes' bellies would be really swelling out and eventually the, and their odour uh, would be developing ready for producing milk. In my teenage years, I did spend some time doing lambing, spent some time on, on farms and took part in lambing in the spring and I think in this whole sense of things being new for the shepherd it was an apprehensive time as well as an exciting time but also a time of very hard work and so our new ventures whether it's a new school or a new job or for the ancient shepherds uh, use about to lamb uh, there's an anticipation there's going to be quite a bit of work and effort needed here in order to produce the desired results. And so my experience of uh, lambing when I was a teenager was that it was really hard work. There was long hours and the shepherd and assistants would have to get up in the middle of the night to check regularly to see if the lambs had been born and then to bring them into shelter and to separate that ewe and lamb so they wouldn't get uh, uh, mixed up so that the mother, the bond between mother and infant would be preserved. So I guess that's a feature of renewal as well, that uh, it's not just oh, just savouring some hopes and dreams in an airy fairy, uh, castles in the air kind of way, but there is uh, a real acknowledgement that some application is going to be requ required in the period coming. So these thoughts have been with me in the last couple of days. And I felt a lot of, I became aware yesterday of a lot of apprehension about doing this broadcast. I was becoming quite anxious. And I realized that I wasn't really aligned with the Imolk theme. And the apprehension aspect, I certainly uh, had that really. Feeling not quite engaged with uh, the emergence of the new season my activities and projects for the coming spring and summer. I even became aware of a certain resistance, a resistance to moving forwards enthusiastically into the spring and the summer. And I guess that animals which hibernate in the winter uh, will probably be aware of this. Uh, it can be very cosy being in your, in your den under the snow. For example, if you're a bear, let's imagine very kind of cosy there and uh, the bears would give birth to their cub in that nice cosy den but then there's the thought you've got to emerge from that nice cosy little world and uh, I do find that in the winter really cosy fireside uh, chats cosy uh, meetings with uh, friends uh, at, the, at the pub let's say or at one of our events 
uh, and it's kind of got to there's going to be an emergence from that into this new phase and I could feel that kind of uh, resistance I want to just stay in this nice cozy winter space to some extent rather than be out rushing about so digging into this I thought well why have I got this uh, I'm not really ready for Imolk and since the, I was going to be giving this uh, webcast this evening this caused me some alarm really how can I speak about Imolk and renewal and awakening and rebirth um, when I'm not really in the right space but spending some time with these feelings, the resistance and the apprehension, I, I began to zoom in on the fact that the resistance was located in my heart. All the right uh, mental, uh, the mental cogs were turning, the intellectualization of renewal, the intellectualization of rebirth, that was all there fine. But what was lacking was the passion, that energy to carry forwards. It, because there will be some apprehension, I don't know what, in, entirely what's going to happen in the spring and the summer. If you think of the very worst possibility, you know, I could die. You know, uh, things could go wrong. There could be all kinds of setbacks, uh, illness, uh, projects fail. It's out of my control. The future is to some extent out of my control. And in order to push forwards through that apprehension just the same as when we're starting a new job or starting a new school we do need that motivation we need that that passion that drive in the heart and today looking deep into my heart it simply wasn't there so the next question was well what is there what what is in my heart and the physical feelings were of heaviness of denseness of, of lifelessness Quite, quite alarming and but I spent time with them I breathed to the heart what's really going on there and then I became aware of the sense of of a weariness weariness in my heart so the next question was what's that about why is my heart kind of weary it's not ready to surge forwards into uh, the new beginnings of spring the fresh start uh, to my spring and summer life and what I realized then uh, well what came to my mind then was a moment ten years ago my first experience of the pagan celebration of Imolk was that I attended a pagan ritual just at this time of year ten years ago about 20 of us in, in a grove outdoors and in the course of that ritual, uh, volunteers were called for to call in the goddess Bridget, who's known under many names like uh, Breed and Bridey and uh, Brigitte and uh, quite a number of names in different uh, traditions over the centuries. Uh, but I've always known her under the name of Bridget, and that's the name that was used in this uh, ceremony that I took part in, this Imolk uh, ceremony of renewal. And uh, so in the course of this ceremony, her help was called in. And I'd kind of forgotten this over the years, kind of lost contact with this ancient pagan uh, goddess of Bridget. In the ceremony ten years ago, uh, I was one of the volunteers who would call in Bridget and there were three of us and there were three lines that we had to call out and my line was the first one, Bridget, wise one, we your children call to you. And then the second person, Lady Smithy, we your children invite you here. And the third call was Triple Goddess, we your children ask for your presence. And these three callings out to Bridget were repeated three times. And I had no experience of Bridget, I only had a vague idea about Imolk at that time. Um, but to my amazement, 
as I called out to Bridget for the third time, we your children called to you, there were, I had a sensation of a, of a rushing of energy, like a strong wind blowing. And to my sheer amazement, uh, the image of a goddess uh, came sweeping over the, uh, the fence or the hedge of this grove where we were. And suddenly Bridget was there above us. I could see her with my, my, my kind of sixth sense, with my visionary sense. There was this uh, vision of, of a huge goddess towering above us with billowing skirts. And I thought, well, that's really odd. Well, such a large vision of a spiritual being. But then I realized that there is this sense of us being children and the maternal aspect of the triple goddess, the maternal aspect of Bridget as a mother who can take care of us and, and safeguard us. So then it made sense, uh, if I'm a small child, then looking up at this maternal figure, uh, she would appear very huge. And of course, in days gone by, when women wore, wore a lot of long, billowing skirts, uh, children did cling on to them and sometimes hide underneath them. Uh, and and there was this sense of a strong maternal presence. And she looked down at me and beamed a smile and she gave me a personal message, which was actually very inspiring at that time of my life. Too personal to share this evening, but it was uh, very inspiring for a stuck area of my life at that time. And it did launch me into a new uh, phase of my life, of my relationship life, actually. So that was my first experience of uh, Bridget, or as she became uh, merged with the, the Christian version, Saint Bridget. And we could say Saint Bridget or Bridget. Interestingly, in the same week that I attended this pagan ceremony and had this vision uh, of this pagan goddess, totally new experience for me. In the same week, I was attending a Christian meditation group which I attended regularly in those years and in that same week I had this vision of a very powerful vein vision of angels and in the following days I reflected on this how come in the same week I could, should have a powerful Christian vision and a powerful pagan vision there is a quote that's also been going around my head this week uh, the origins of this quote are a little bit uh, disputed, possibly it comes from Gautama, Gautama Buddha, but it, the origin is a little bit disputed. But the quote is, there are no holy places and no holy people, only holy moments, only holy moments of wisdom. And I've always found uh, quite a lot of wisdom in that particular quote. That, although it might be in what we regard as holy places, it's the holy moments there that really count. And some places which aren't very holy, don't seem very holy in one moment, can seem very holy in another. So only holy moments, holy moments of wisdom, uh, wisdom by which I understand moments of insight, moments of renewal moments of taking a new look at thing a new look at things seeing the world with new eyes seeing ourselves with new eyes so in the days after i'd had these twin uh these twin visions from very very different spiritual paths i had a holy moment of wisdom it just came to me in an instant uh, a sense of knowing that actually angels and pagan goddesses are the same really and what we experience is based on our particular beliefs and our particular path but there's something essentially very similar in those two types of uh, feminine divine presence and the inspiration that we can gain from them. So over the years that have gone by, I've kind of lost touch with Bridget, talked about her at times of Imolk and been involved in 
you know, celebrations every year over the last 10 years. But had no real powerful connection with her as I did at that time. But then today, when I'm looking into my heart and where is, where is this passion that will carry me forward in the months ahead into new experiences and a new experience of myself. Uh, and so I, f I found myself very, just very naturally, without any effort, uh, remembering Bridget and remembering what she meant to me at that time, 10 years ago, that she, she kind of came when I needed her with a message of inspiration and a very maternal kind of presence. And when I looked into my heart and looked at the weariness, which is kind of, which had been blocking me from speaking to you this evening and also from surging ahead in the weeks that are coming, there was this sense of weariness. And I realized that underneath this weariness was a woundedness, a woundedness of my heart. And of course the heart is so important in our fresh approaches, our ventures into fresh faces, phases of life. The engagement of the heart, uh, loving ourselves, loving the experiences, loving life, loving the opportunities that life brings. And having a passion for certain things that can drive us forward through the insecurities and the anxieties and the resistances of inertia hibernation. So I realised that underneath my weariness was kind of a woundedness and then I became aware of a couple of incidents this week where I had felt very wounded by quite quite minor things and of course when we put our hearts into projects as I like to do as I've learned to do we put our heart and soul into particular projects and activities which in my experience makes them much more fulfilling and, uh, and also connects us to other people and makes them co-creative. And uh, some co-creative work that I've been involved in, which has involved my open heart, the drawback to opening our heart and putting it into projects is that it's kind of vulnerable and sometimes we get a, we get a bit of a harsh or unjust treatment and this can, can be a little bit wounding to the heart. So I became aware that over a period of time, I can't say weeks or months, when I put my heart into a number of projects which had been really nice to do in the winter months, that I've also taken on a bit of heart woundedness. And, and so what am I going to do with this heart woundedness, which is producing the symptom of a kind of a weariness and inertia. And at that point, the memory of the goddess Bridget came to me uh, and also I just had a, a vision, a vision appeared in which uh, I saw her in her home. Um, just trying to recall exactly what happened. A word came to my mind uh, and the word is mumsy, mumsy. And some of the people I know use the word mumsy to describe uh, women of a certain personality, women who are very strongly maternally inclined. Mumsy women when people who I know speak about someone being mumsy, they will, uh, the image that, that comes up is of somebody who lives in a fairly chaotic household, but a, but a household that's always full of love and hugs, and where there's always a lot of mothering. And I've been fortunate enough in my life to be in households like that, and not always my own family, uh, where actually you just get a lot of mothering. It, it, especially of course you've just had a bit of a, a bad time in life for one reason or another you can find yourself in this mumsy kind of household where there's just a lot of warm affection um, quite often because the emphasis of the household is on the heart then it's not always as neat and orderly as sharp as, as some of the households might be but it has this mumsy quality and of course Bridget and St Bridget uh, are associated, long associated with home and hearth and the pagan goddess Bridget uh, is the patroness of many human activities uh, including craft work hence the word smithy in, in the, that invocation of Bridget which I've already quoted 
So she's also associated with heart, with hearth, heart, heart, hearth and home. Uh, the three H's, heart, hearth and home. And in my vision today, I immediately saw her in in this mumsy uh, self. Quite often the, the mumsy, when people talk about somebody being mumsy, they often mean a little bit overweight as well because the people who are very compulsive motherers uh, give out a lot of mothering but often don't uh, get that much back in return and men men can have this mumsy quality it's not just a, a female thing men can have these uh, nurturing qualities uh, and so there's also always this kind of over slightly overweight aspect where um, the person who gives out a lot of mothering has to do a bit of comfort eating of themselves because everybody expects to receive from them and draw from them and they don't always get a good replenishment. So certainly my my visions, of course these are very personal uh, visions of Bridget, uh, she's she's kind of overweight and wears these voluminous long uh, dresses uh, around which her children, many children can cling and, and can hide underneath when they're feeling vulnerable. So I found myself in a vision with uh, Bridget there and she's there in the home and the warm hearth, the fireside hearth. And I felt myself as a little child. And in particular, what had come to me was a photograph of myself when I was a very small child, three or four years old. And there was a qualities in that photograph which I associate with renewal, with being new, because there's kind of an innocence aspect to that, whether it's the new school, the new employee, the newly wed, we're kind of innocent in this new world that we have just entered and in this photograph of myself that I remember as a small boy in which I identified with in this moment of reconnection to Bridget uh, I, uh, I recognise these qualities of this kind of innocent vulnerability and it's this, this thing which is such a lovely fresh quality to bring to any new project new activity in our life, a new relationship kind of fresh vulnerable innocence it's such a lovely thing but of course it does easily get wounded and a couple of incidents this day uh, this week where I was uh, in situations where I'd done my best but got some kind of harsh insensitive and unjust uh, kind of re response and felt that it put me in touch with this good good aspect put me in touch with my heart needed a bit of repair work so here I find myself in this vision with Bridget, tears flow. And I find myself clinging to her voluminous skirts as a small child. And I tell her my troubles. And when the vision ended, I actually wrote, wrote a letter to her, you could say as well. Wrote a letter just saying, you know, what a harsh world. And I, I can remember this vision where I'm with Bridget in her hearth and home. Uh, and there's this whole sense of the hostile world is out there, this hostile, insensitive world that doesn't always treat us very well. It can be demanding, sometimes punitive, pressurizing. Uh, and so I'm back in this, this little child heart and uh, a needing, needing that mothering kind of quality uh, which I got from this, this goddess, from the vision of the goddess, from this archetypal form, you could say, however you choose to look at it. It's a spiritual entity or an archetypal form in my own conscious. Uh, but it was what I needed. Um, my heart felt repaired and my passion for the coming days and weeks was restored. And even my passion to speak to you this evening uh, was restored. So thank you for spending time with me this evening. I would like to end with a little uh, a little prayer a little celtic blessing prayer on the subject of peace deep peace of the running waves to you deep peace of the silent stars deep peace of the flowing air to you deep peace of the quiet earth May peace, may peace, may peace fill your soul. May peace 
May peace, may peace make you whole. I believe it's that wholeness which has a sense of peace attached that I want to bring to my unfolding projects for the coming spring and summer. And I wish all of you that same blessing, a blessing of wholeness and peace and resourcefulness and that love of life which will draw us forward to the next step of our life journey. Thank you for being with me this evening.